Okay, we're back for live. It's, uh, it's not Wednesday, it's Tuesday, but we're having our Wednesday program has, uh, uh, that is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We're having a special edition of it with Eric Gleason, uh, who is the senior man in Next Era Energy right here in Hawaii. Thanks for being on the show, Eric. Thank you, Jay. There's so many things going on in energy here, as we were discussing before. They're extraordinary. I mean, it, it seems like the most important initiative, the most important phenomenon process point of, of anything and everything that's going on. More important than rail, even. <laughs> uh, I don't know that I'd go that far. That's pretty important. <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's uh, try to set the stage. Um, it's been my impression that energy is happening on the mainland, in fact, happening in the world. And you guys are a big player. Next Era is a big player um, in that. And I wonder if you could give us a sort of a status report on what's going on on the mainland, what's, what's moving where. I mean, for example, the president got, you know, has a new initiative about uh, carbon. Um, what's going to happen? What is happening? What are the drivers? So I think the overall thing is energy is getting cleaner and it's getting cheaper. So it's getting cleaner because renewable energy technology is getting better and better. Um, and, that, and it's getting cheaper because of that and because of the shale revolution. So the shale revolution has turned the U.S. into an energy exporter. It's, it's a big part of driving our economy. Uh, but at the same time, you've got renewable energy that's, that's coming in and getting more and more competitive. So, um, you know, we are, we are, you know, through innovation, this country is an energy leader in the world. And it's, it's great for our economy. Yeah, what did I hear recently that some of the coal companies are going out of business? Because of the shale revolution. Yeah, so, so the last company I worked at before Next Era Energy, we were in the business of, of coal fire generation. That was part of our business. It was in Appalachia. And uh, it's been pretty clear for a while that that was going to be a tough business with environmental regulations. And then once shale gas came in, uh, gas is what uh, the price of natural gas drives the price of power in most of the country. And so it became very, very difficult for coal fired plants to compete. Once the coal-fired plants can't compete, they shut down, and that means there's no market for the coal. So it's a very tough business to be in. You've got to have both ends working or it just stops. Yeah, now, what about the problem of uh, the environmental problem around uh, fracking and all that around? Uh, I mean, uh, is the technology that we have today on LNG, for example, and yeah. the shale yeah. revolution, uh, such that we are, we are mm, able to address this whole environmental issue, or is it, is it a, an issue that isn't quite solved? So, uh, first of all, I'll just confess, I'm not an expert on it, and I don't want to um, minimize people's concerns. Uh, my overall impression, having, having lived in places where there's fracking, uh, but also having talked to a lot of people here in Hawaii, is I certainly understand their concerns. I think the technology, uh, the, the compliance uh, is getting better. Um, I know there have been incidents, at least in the past, I've seen some statistics that suggest, um, I think it was in Pennsylvania in the Marcellus Shale, that most of the problems were with smaller, less sophisticated operators. Um, there's certainly plenty of places in the U.S. where, you know, they welcome fracking. Uh, but, but as I say, I'm, I'm not an expert and, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to minimize it. So where, where is the, the industry going on a national basis? I think it seems clear that we're in a period of consolidation and there are some huge energy companies out there doing huge business and serving multiple states, uh, multiple regions, um, which have very deep pockets and which are, um, you know, building a new industry while you watch. Yeah. Uh, and I think that uh, Next Era is part of that, no? Uh, we are. I would say um, overall, whether you're talking, if you're talking about energy, uh, whether you're talking oil and gas or utilities, for a long time there's been a trend of uh, companies combining to form larger companies and then at the same time you've got companies that start up and so there's a constant pipeline of, of new companies that are coming into the industry you know on the oil and gas side um, we've you know had companies like Exxon Mobil and, and combinations like that over time but then you get the independent exploration and production companies that are just very nimble and, and like some of the companies that develop fracking technology for example um, and then on the power side um, of course, we have new technology-oriented companies that are coming up all the time. Uh, but amongst utilities, I think uh, overall there's been a, a, a consolidation. So it used to be we had around, I'd say about 20 years ago, we had around 90 
investor-owned utilities in the country, it's about half that now. Interesting. That's just a general secular trend because it's a very fragmented inter industry and, and, and it's an industry where there are economies of scale so you can, you can reduce costs for customers by combining and so over time that's what's happening. That's, that's really interesting, half. Um, and economies of scale certainly work when you're dealing with changing technology. But is there a point where you have too few companies controlling too many markets? Well, that, that is, in fact, how we, kind of how we got here because uh, that concern. Uh, during the Great Depression, there were very large utility holding companies. And uh, there was a concern that, you know, that had been part of, uh, there was a lot of leverage that was used in those structures. They weren't well regulated. And there was a concern that they contributed to the decline in the stock market and, and the depression. So that's how we ended up with a very atomized electric sector in this country. Um, you know, now every, every merger that happens is scrutinized, both at the federal and the state level. So I think the, the, actually the, the barriers to consolidation are very significant. And the reason why we still have close to 50 investor-owned utilities in the country is because the bar is so high to actually put these companies together. What, what are the regulators looking at when they judge these companies? So, you know, at the federal level, uh, so, so anytime you, you merge um, two utilities, you end up uh, applying to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And the main thing that they're focused on is uh, will there be what they call market power? So will there would be a reduction in competition if there's uh, amongst the generation assets, uh, particularly if they're in the same market? And then um, they worry about will there be cross subsidization between a utility and non utility? So those are things they focus on. And then at the state level, it's the same kind of issues that we're, the things that we're looking at here in Hawaii. In fact, a lot of, a lot of the witnesses that we're seeing in our process here uh, in Hawaii are, are witnesses in, in other jurisdictions. Um, so they're looking at uh, how will customers benefit is really first and foremost. Uh, is this, uh, and is this uh, merger counterparty, is this potential acquirer, are they, are they up to the job of, you know, of being entrusted with you know such important infrastructure. So Those are the main mean, concerns. Reliability. Well, the, the, no. the technical standard is fit, willing, and able. But basically, it means you know will they preserve reliability? Do they actually know how to operate a utility? Uh, will they have the financial capacity to make the investments that are required? You know, do they have? Are they are they going to be able to provide effective oversight of the operations? Those are the sorts what of issues. Rates? Are rates part of that? Yeah, you know, rates always comes up. Definitely, not only there's sort of a Will this combination not, you know, what will it do for all those other things we just talked about? And then how are customers actually going to benefit financially? And, and not every merger has to necessarily offer financial benefits to customers in order to uh, proceed, but, you know, typically there are some. Yeah. So as part of the national sea change on this, I, I would call it that, uh, renewables come into play. And, you know, we saw wind, we see solar now, we see we see all kinds of variations on solar, as a matter of fact. And uh, we, we see other things. We see uh, hydropower, and we see geothermal in some places. Uh, I'm sure I've missed a couple. Well, no, but those are, those are the big ones. Yeah. yeah. So how, do, how is that playing in, in it all? I mean, it is, is the national drift as robust as it is in Hawaii to reach renewables? It is not as robust, uh, but it is, it is the secular trend. Um, so in Hawaii today, uh, you've gone from a very small amount of renewables to, I think it's 22% across the Hawaiian electric companies today. That's extremely high. Uh, and, and if you, if you drill, double click on that to rooftop solar, where you've got 12% of households with rooftop solar, that, that's 10 times the penetration of, of anywhere else. So there's been, there's been a tremendous upsurge in renewable energy here in Hawaii for, for the reasons you know, you, you know well. But I think the overall secular trend across the U.S. is for more renewables, and that's in part driven by people's environmental concerns, and it's in part driven by economics because, you know, gone are the days when customers had to pay a big premium in order to feel good about, you know, what they were doing for the environment. Now it's actually cost effective, even in, a, even in an environment with uh, unprecedented low gas prices and therefore low power prices. Uh, renewables are still, we're finding competitive in a lot of markets. So, so for example, we just announced yesterday that um, we're on track to bring into service 5,000 megawatts of wind and solar projects between this year and 2018. So, I mean, you could, you could power all of Hawaii with, with that much renewables. Yeah, well, indeed you could. 
What about the, the, the notion of companies and these initiatives going global? I mean, I, I don't know if this is happening, yeah. but I, I wonder if you know. If I take, a, say, a big utility company in the mainland, any chance that that would be a company that would try to make inroads in Europe or in Asia and do business there also? So I spent, uh, I spent a lot of my career going back and forth between Europe and the U.S. Uh, with utilities, and that has certainly happened before. Uh, in the 90s, that was a big trend. U.S. companies going to Europe or trying to go to Europe. Uh, generally, we haven't done that well. Uh, a lot of U.S. companies have lost money, and European companies have, have lost money coming the same way. So, uh, generally speaking, it's not a big trend. There are a couple of, there is one U.S. utility here that has a significant presence in the U.K., and there are a couple of um, European companies that have a significant presence here in the U.S., but I don't see a lot of people lining up to, to move in, other, in either direction. It's, and, you know, the issue is, the issue is really, while there are things that are global, globally relevant in the utility business, by and large, uh, you know, local culture and context is really important. And, you know, Hawaii is an example of that. But I'd say there's more in common between U.S. utilities than there are between U.S. utilities and, say, you know, different countries. It's a reflection of the of the economy, the sociology, the way business is done in that, in that country, I suppose. And, um, uh, and, and that's why they don't necessarily um, mix. Yeah, the utility business is harder than a lot of people realize. <laughs> I'm sure. So let's talk about, uh, let's talk about Next Era. Um, Next Era, where does it fit in the national landscape of the, this consolidating uh, sea change? Well, um, Obviously, we're here. We're here in Hawaii, uh, looking at a you know a merger, uh, so we're we're interested in uh, in being a consolidator. Uh, we don't need to consolidate. Uh, we have a lot of the company's got a lot of growth prospects. We're able to to uh, develop new renewable energy projects. We've got a lot of investment opportunities in Florida, and we can do acquisitions outside of the utility uh, arena. So, for example, we just announced yesterday an, an acquisition of of several pipelines in Texas. So, but... That'd be gas. Gas pipelines, yeah. So, but, um, uh, but, you know, we are open to, to consolidation opportunities. It makes sense, and we think fundamentally this is an industry that, that remains ripe for consolidation uh, because of the economies of scale and because of the, the, the performance differences that you see between companies. Um, so, our, you know, our, our company um, benchmarks pretty well on, on, you know, the variety of things that utilities measure themselves against. And so we see opportunities to, uh, you know, to potentially combine with another company and improve the performance. That, that means buy, doesn't it, at the end of the day? Uh, yes. So uh, when, when, you, um, <clears throat> when you want to, uh, uh, when you come to Hawaii and you want to um, buy Hawaiian Electric, uh, what, what's the motivation of the company? Of course, the, the company wants to make a buck, mm -hmm. um, but there's something else, uh, you know, you mentioned, and that is uh, maybe you think you can do better. Uh, maybe you think that uh, your skill, your resources, uh, can actually do the same job in a, in a better way somehow. I, what, is, what is, if you can articulate, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the reason that NextEra is interested in Hawaiian Electric? Yeah. So anytime we look at an acquisition, I think, I think most companies are the same way. We start with what's the strategic logic, and then it needs to check the financial boxes as well. So the starting point is strategy. So our, our strategy is to be North America's leading clean energy company. That's what we want to do. Um, you know, with a large, that's the most top of the line. That's, that's, what, that's how number we, one. That's how we see ourselves. Um, you know, for example, uh, we're the largest generator of renewable energy from the wind and sun in the world. So we, we've had a lot of success uh, both at, in the renewable energy business and also in Florida on getting off of oil. So, you know, and, and we're in a consolidating industry. So we look at Hawaii. For, firstly, we came here thinking, boy, this is like, this, is, this kind of has parallels with both sides of our business, right? On the one hand, we've got this utility that's got off of oil. And on the other hand, we're in renewable energy, you know, pretty big time. So we look at Hawaii and we say, this is the place where you combine. You, Hawaii wants to combine both, right, in a way that no one's, to an extent, and in a way and at a speed that no one's ever done before. And, you know, we knew that before there was 100% renewable energy law. So, so we looked at that and said, how can we, you know, how can we play in that? 
We're in most U.S. states, but we weren't really doing much in Hawaii. This goes back about five years. And so, really, we've been here ever since trying to figure out, you know, what are the right opportunities where we can actually solve problems here, uh, bring clean energy in, and, you know, make things better. And, yes, you know, they, these need to be reasonable investments that we're making. And that's really what led us You've to the You've been Hawaii making electric. investments over the past five years. Well, not in as many Hawaii investments as we'd like, but we've, we've <laughs> okay. been here and, you know, we've been pursuing opportunities. What, what kinds of opportunities? I mean, I read uh, articles and I, I see you've got something yeah. going over there, over yeah. there. You, you've been active. So we've, I'd say there's probably three classes of things, three classes of things we've focused on, um, wind, uh, solar projects and the cable, the, the inner island cable between Oahu and Maui. Those are the three things that we've really spent most of our time on. And, you know, candidly, we don't have a lot to show for it at this point. Um, there, we got irons in the fire, uh, but uh, the approach we've taken is we realize when you come here to Hawaii, um, there, while there's a lot of desire for clean energy transformation, it can be, it can be a challenging place to develop energy projects. And so, you know, we've tried to be, we've tried to take a holistic view, we try to be patient, and, um, you know, we're optimistic. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll get to that, but uh, going back to the, the other projects you've done, I mean, would, are these projects that you've been doing, say, the past five years, when, whatever it is, uh, or scoping out the past five years, are they related to your attempts to, um, to, to buy uh, Hawaiian Electric, or are they standalone? In other words, you, would you have done them anyway? And would you continue to do them now anyway? Yeah. So, so we would have done them anyway. In fact, you know, when we started down the path, when we first started coming here to Hawaii and st first started working on these various initiatives, you know, uh, I'd say Hawaiian Electric was not, not even a glimmer in our eye. Um, uh, you know, now, now, we're, now we've kind of taken the next step and said, well, actually, there's a lot more we could do in Hawaii together with Hawaiian Electric. So, so that's how we got here over the last year. Um, and in terms of, you know, what happens um, uh, in the future, you know, I, I don't know at this point. Well, let's, let's take a break okay. and come back and, and talk about what's happening now and, and what the elements are. Uh, that's Eric Gleason. Uh, he's the senior official in Hawaii from Next Era uh, Energy. Uh, here we are in Hawaii, the state of clean energy, and we're talking about, uh, we're talking about Next Era. Tonight is a discussion of Next Era. We'll be right back after this break and we'll, we'll go for more. Aloha, my name is Miley Scarpino and I'm the host of the Empower Hour. If you're interested in health, nutrition, fitness, here on the island of Oahu, want to learn more about places to train at or different trainers available, then watch my show on Fridays at 3. We have a great time and I hope that you'll come join us. Much aloha. Now go get swole. Aloha, my name is PJ and I'm the host of Hawaii Sports Update. I am very interested in local sports and that's why I host the Hawaii Sports Update show. I bring in guests from Hawaii, I bring in guests from UH, I bring in guests from the community, I bring in big names, I bring in small names, I bring in all names that are community related and doing positive things, sports related in the community. Come join me every Tuesday at 1 p.m. here on Hawaii Sports Update. You can also join me on my golf tournament, the first annual PJ Sports Radio Show Golf Tournament. It's going to be held at Coral Creek. For any information, go to Think Tech Hawaii, I-N-C, and friend us. The PayPal and a summary of the event will be right there, available for you. And don't forget to tweet us. Okay, we're here with Eric Gleason talking about uh, Next Era Energy, and there's a lot to cover. Uh, but going back for a moment, um, uh, no, you know, it's been reported that uh, uh, NextEra has, uh, in Florida, not been, you know, expanding renewables as much as we have in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's a small percentage of your, of your sources. Uh, can, can you comment on that? Yeah, it is a smaller percentage of our, of our resources in Florida. Um, I mean, we, have, we actually have more renewable energy than any other utility in Florida. Uh, but th what, what, what's helpful to realize is that the context is different. So, so in Florida, for example, they don't have a renewable portfolio standard. They're not targeting a certain amount of renewables. The, the rule in Florida is a utility is supposed to procure the lowest cost resources. And so the most cost effective. So what that means is whenever we're looking at a need for a new generating plant, 
um, if it's if it typically it's either gas or now we're getting to a point where it can be solar so we've just announced that we're going to build some more solar plants because it's actually the most cost-effective resource for the next investment so we're doing as much as we can we're big fans of solar um, but it's it's a different it's a different um, policy focus really and as a utility you know you don't set those rules um, you have to you have to follow what the policymakers and the commission want you to do and ultimately you know I think that's probably a reflection of customers in Florida who really value having low-cost power well so here we are in Hawaii and we like renewables but there's a lot of things we don't agree on there's a fair number of controversies excluding anything with next era yeah and um, you know this is Hawaii the state of controversy in many ways is that right <laughs> I could show you <laughs> articles in the paper every day yeah. um, and the question is you know what is what is attractive about this uh, to you a lot of a lot of companies won't come here yeah uh, because they think there's too much controversy too much resistance to foreign investment yeah and you still insist on coming here you know you know I the truth is okay we've done a lot of homework and so, you know, we knew about some of the troubles that the rail project would ha had had and, and super ferry and et cetera. And, um, you know, had got a lot of advice about how, how to be, um, how, to, how to do, how to be involved in energy development the right way and, and you know, to be patient. Um, but I will say that, you know, the thing I've learned over the last uh, six or so months is that, you know, it's even more challenging than I realized. Yeah, uh, so you, you announced in, what November twenty fourth? December third, yeah. Yeah, you've probably seen some things you didn't you didn't expect. You want to tell me what surprises you most? I think just the level of, uh, I think the 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 mildest word I would use is concern about a mainland company coming in and you know potentially taking over ownership of the local utility. You know, understood there would be some skepticism about a you know a mainland corporation that that you know based based on history right it's not it's not without a basis but uh, I don't think we understood at least in many for many people the level of emotion around that and you know it um, w you know we, we come in here thinking that boy this is this is great on paper and wanting to you know wanting to do things the right way um, but it's sometimes those arguments are they don't the data the arguments the logic doesn't stick as well when, when people are just very concerned about about you know a mainland company coming in yeah, uh, well, we've had that same experience with many companies, uh, but let's let's talk about what's been going on. I mean, you, so no sooner do you file an application for approval of, of this deal, uh, I guess on the on the legal test of whether it serves the best interests yeah. of the of this of the public, and there are almost thirty interveners, mm. and most of them, as it, as it has worked out, oppose you. Yes. Uh, you know? uh, now, I guess when you file a, an intervention. You're not there because you know. Um, you're, you're not love there the as a, deal. You're not there as a cheerleader, <laughs> right? So it's <laughs> it's not a surprise that you got resistance, but uh, there must be some surprise that all this resistance, including resistance from government agencies, has sprung out. Yeah. So I would say actually there was, uh, not not to, um, uh, you know, I, I don't want I don't want people to feel like I'm dissing their testimony, but there was nothing terribly surprising in the testimony from the interveners. And that's because this is the nature of the process. Okay, as the governor actually said, we're early in the process. Uh, we filed our initial arguments. The interveners have asked a lot of questions, and then they filed their initial arguments. And now we're in the process of preparing our responsive arguments. Actually, we're still waiting for the consumer advocates' arguments. I'm calling it arguments, but that's technically it's week. testimony. Yeah. That's a tenth, yeah. yeah. So, you know, that's the problem. You got a lot of lawyers involved, and nothing against lawyers. I love lawyers, spend a lot of time with them. But, you know, they, they like, they make arguments. And, you know, pe people um, will look at, our, look at our application, look at the information. And what most of them are saying is, well, we don't agree with this as it's proposed by Next Era and Hawaiian Electric. Uh, but if the commission wanted to approve it, here are the conditions we'd be looking for. Uh, that's the approach that most people take. And so, and so the next step in the process, and we'll see what the consumer advocate says, but you know, the next step in the process is we have to digest all of that and understand what the concerns and the arguments are, and then, and then we need to respond. And, so, and then you go through this process, you continue on to public listening sessions and, and a hearing in December. And so there's a lot more 
arguments, facts, opportunities. I'd say the most important thing is opportunities to find the middle ground. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe not in all cases, but hopefully we can find some common ground yeah. with some of these folks. So that's, that's the process, and it's early. How, how would you compare this process uh, against the process um, in other acquisitions or mergers in other states that you've been involved in? Uh, I would say it is the, the, the outline of the process that, that I just went through is very similar uh, state to state. In, in some states, uh, they go about it quicker, candidly. I mean, the, they may have uh, in law a statutory deadline. Um, it is extraordinary the number of interveners that are in this docket. We, uh, and, and I don't say that to be critical. It's just, it's just a fact. Uh, we went back to 2010 and looked at every merger application for a utility in North America, and and this you know this is the record at least to 2010. Um, so it's a and you know, and this is a good thing too. But um, there's no state where energy is as as high profile as it is in Hawaii. I mean, it just matters a whole heck of a lot here, which is part of the reason why we're here, right? It's part of what makes it interesting to us. But you know, one of the one of the implications of that for this process is it's just it's in the papers every day. People are talking about it. So, you know, I'll I'll, I'll add it, it adds a little bit of pressure to the whole thing. But you know, that's that's a good thing. Well, you know, we 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 spend a lot of money for fossil fuel. Yeah, you do. We have great expectations, obviously, for renewables, uh, and um, you know, with all the contention with Hawaiian Electric. Uh, uh, they're the down-home company. Yes. And, um, and you know, it's interesting that uh, when, when a, th a third party comes in and now there's another party in the mix, um, people, you know, return to that fact. It's yes. It's a down-home company. Um, so which, which uh, takes me actually to, uh, you know, exactly w what is going on. Uh, I think, you know, one of the issues that's been raised is what is your plan? I remember that came up in a, yeah. in a hearing. I think it was a joint energy committee hearing. In the uh, in the legislature are last you, year, are what, you referring what? to Senator Baker's? If you remember Senator Ross Baker, she she challenged us. You know, yeah, how are customers yeah, yeah. going to benefit from yeah, this? Yeah. So actually, um, six months later, we have an answer for her. <laughs> Good. Okay. Well, we had an we had an we actually had an answer the next day. We filed our application with the PUC and we laid out sixty million in benefits for customers over four years. Uh, but we have continued to refine the answer. So as we've gone through this process. We've now responded, just so you know, to uh, about 4,000 questions. We filed 40,000 pages of responses to 4,000 questions. And as part of that, you know, we've done, we've continued to, to do analysis and sharpen our pencils. And so we uh, just filed something recently that, that laid out about a billion dollars of total savings in, the, in expenditures that the utility wouldn't have to make between, over, over what yeah, between, between uh, 2016 and 2020. And during that, uh, during that period, what that equates to is about $400 for a typical residential customer, okay, to save over that, over that period. It's so my, it's, not, my, it's, not, it's not peanuts, right? It doesn't make the whole bill go away. It's still, you know, the bills are still high here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's real money. Yeah. Well, I mean, and various questions on various issues, like, uh, and I will ask you when we come back from this break, uh, you know, uh, your expectations or your mm, plan on each of these questions and I guess there's you know what's your plan on um, distributed energy if you if you have one to talk about what is your plan on grid and storage investment I guess maybe you've answered that in part already uh, because the, the 60 million would be would be oh, we can uh, talk more about that yeah and, and uh, what's your plan on uh, liquefied natural gas and uh, and rates those things I think be really constructive to, um, you know, to talk about that and, and what, what people should know about your plan. Yeah. Okay? We'll Good. take a short break again. Um, that's uh, this Eric Gleason. He's the senior man in Next, uh, Next Era Energy here. And uh, we're talking about Next Era's plan, among other things, here on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We are delighted to have him here with us. We'll be right back. One minute. Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the basis of what's right, what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. 
Every week we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Eric Gleason, uh, Next energy, Next Era Energy, Next Era Energy. Uh, you know, I wish we had more time. There's really a lot to talk about. As you said, this is, this is central news and interest uh, for the public. And in my view, the public needs to be educated more than it has been about uh, energy in general, and certainly about this deal, which is huge for Hawaii, not only in energy, but in everything. It's the biggest deal we ever had, you know, which makes it a little scary for some people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, let's talk about um, exactly, you know, what, what you have in mind when you, when you come forward and say, we, we want to take over this company, and we want to do right by the state, uh, and I assume that's inherent in all of this. Um, and people ask you, well, what's your plan on this? What's yeah. your plan on that? Uh, so can you give us a, a handle, if you will, on some of those things I listed? Uh, first thing, uh, which is a hot issue, yeah. distributed energy, distributed energy uh, resources. Uh, how, how would you handle that? How will you handle yeah. that? So, so I'm going to give you, it's probably going to sound like a, a very fluffy answer. And then I'd like to kind of explain why, why it is what it is. So, so our approach on distributed energy is the same today as it was the day we announced the merger, which is we're big supporters of it. Uh, it's important here in Hawaii today. It's going to continue to be important. Uh, Hawaiian Electric said they support tripling it. You know, I, I don't know if tripling is the right number, if it's less or it's more. At the end, you know, I think the market will decide. Um, but we are supportive of it, and the job of the utility is to make it possible for customers to exercise those choices. So, so, you know, it's a big part of the future here, and we, and we support it. Um, wh you know, whether it's that or some of the other issues that, that I know we can talk about, like, like liquefied natural gas or, you know, well, what's... On that one, you know, there's yeah. three possibilities. There's rooftop. Yeah. Um, there's putting, say, PV in, uh, in either community yeah. PV installations yeah. or in installations by the utility. Yes. Or in all three or four, yeah. whatever number of logical possibilities. So, do you, I mean, do you have a, a model that you follow in Florida that you would follow here? Do you have a model in mind to deal with here? Um, and is anything off limits? Is anything especially, uh, you know, emphatic for you? Uh, where do you see the solution to all the controversy that's going on around it? Uh, so, so I think an awful lot of the controversy up until now has just been a whole bunch of people lining up wanting rooftop solar and feeling like, and I understand why they feel this way, that it just hasn't gone fast enough, right? I think if it weren't for that, we probably wouldn't even be having this discussion. Um, so that is something that, that you know, some progress has been made, but there is still more work to do, be done to, to make it, you know, efficient for people to, to hook up their solar. And I think as part of it, there's a lot of debate right now. There's a process before the commission to uh, change the, the programs under which people can put rooftop solar in and, and get compensation the net from the net energy program, metering. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's a lot going on there. Uh, it, all, all that said, people are going to continue to have the choice to put rooftop solar in the house. And it's just like we have or their business. And equally, we have that, our customers have that choice in Florida. Do they have net energy metering? They now? do, yeah. We have net energy metering. Now, we don't have a lot of, we don't have many people who take us up on it. Um, we, you know, we actually, for, in, in Florida, it's a really quick process. At our, at our utility, if you, if you send us the paperwork, from the time we get your paperwork to the time we've replaced your meter and connected you is 12 days on average. So there's not this long queue. But we only have a few thousand customers. So you don't have those interconnect circuit problems. We don't have those problems. Now, I'm not trying to throw Hawaiian Electric under the bus. We don't have the level of penetration that makes it easier. But, you know, we've got a quick process. We're not standing in the customer's way if they want it. The issue is the customers aren't asking for it because the rates are so low. You know, our customers pay under 10 cents, 9.7 cents a kilowatt hour. So they're not lining up for rooftop solar. But they have the choice. And, that, and that's the right, way, the right way to do it. You can't. You know, you need to give your customers a choice. So that will continue here. Do you have uh, any idea what kind of rates you could achieve here? 
uh, I think lower. Um, I think that in the in, in the I'll call it the medium term until we're off of oil, there is a there is a there is a piece of the rate equation, a big piece of the rate equation that the utility doesn't control. So, but set that aside. If oil prices stayed the same, I think rates can come down as renewable energy substitutes for oil, and as we find other ways to to take costs out of the system. Uh, but how low exactly? It's too early for, for us to really be able to say that. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing about um, net energy metering and all is, uh, uh, you know, we we have certain issues going on here, and, uh, and you know, a lot of argument going on. How how close are the numbers? Uh, that is the base rate um, that is charged here, and the what do you call it, export rate that mm -hmm. is charged here, to the numbers that you have going in Florida. Well, they're not uh, now. I, you know, I should I should know. I don't remember what our base rate is. Um, it's not. I don't think it's very high. I don't think that's a differentiator. The difference is the export rate. Okay, here you're at, as we st sit here today. If you're if you're a homeowner and you've got. Uh, you know, rooftop PV, you're exporting at the full retail rate of, you know, call it 30 cents a kilowatt hour. In Florida, if you're one of our customers, you're exporting at 9.7 cents. So it's less than... Yeah, it's so, less so than it's the not do all the numbers, um, you know, depending on how you do it. It's something like a 15 to 20 year payback period in Florida, and it's a few years here. So it's a great investment here if you're a homeowner. If you're in Florida, it's not really something you do as an investment. Yeah. So but what, what's the reasoning to make... Uh, the, the export rate lower than the retail rate. Well, so, so and just, just to clarify, in, in Florida, p customers are getting compensated at the full retail rate, just like here. It's just that the retail rate is lower. I see. So, so uh, but what people are arguing here, and, and in other parts of the country, is that the export rate for net energy metering should not be the full retail rate. And, and it should be something lower than that. And that's, in fact, you know, a big part of, the, of what's before the commission right now here in Hawaii. And, and the rationale for it is, think about it in simplest terms. If you as a customer had a, forget your, you're not a, imagine you're not a rooftop solar customer. You're just, you know, you just, just Ordinary a normal problem. customer. So, you know, whatever the cost of the electricity that the, that the utility acquires, they're going to pass through to you. They don't make a markup right. on it. I'm, they just, they just pass that. it through. You're paying for it. Yeah. So would you, if you want to buy a kilowatt hour of solar in that mix, would you rather buy it from somebody's rooftop system at 30 cents a kilowatt hour, or would you rather buy it from some, you know, utility scale IPP who's selling it at 13 cents a kilowatt hour? Do you want to pay 30, or do you want to pay 13? That's the argument that people are making for why the retail rate should yeah, should come down. Certainly in play. Yeah. Moving moving on to another element of the distributed energy. Now that you know there was a whole bunch of these waiver projects yeah. where the utility was uh, trying to get uh, people to do large uh, PV uh, utility scale yeah. uh, PV installations uh, where uh, you, you could generate PV without people putting it on their rooftop. Um, and this seems like an interesting kind of element in in making, um, you know, making a multifaceted PV initiative. Uh, what about that? How, how, do you, how does NextEra feel about that? So are you talking about community solar or no, are you talking, talking about, about utility, utility scale? Utility scale solar. Four of them were approved yeah, in four the last of them couple were of approved. days. Yeah. So there, there were eight projects. Uh, four of them were approved. One was disapproved. Three of them are pending. Yeah. One of the ones that's pending is actually a NextEra that's energy right. project. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not going to... I don't want to steal the commission's thunder, but I'm not that optimistic about the three they haven't approved. But we'll see what they do. Um, but you know, overall, our our view is it, it it look. Not all customers have rooftops in the sun that they own and can afford to have rooftop solar. Right? That's always going to be a minority of the customers, and so we got to think about the other customers too, and how can we provide them with cleaner and more affordable power? So I think. Utility scale, sol utility scale solar and renewables generally is, is part of the portfolio. And I think overall, you know, we should be thinking about this as a portfolio of renewable energy resources, not just, you know, one thing. Yeah. And, and I guess the fact that you put in for uh, a waiver project <laughs> bespeaks your position on that because yeah. you'd like to be involved in it. Yeah. <laughs> and that was a pretty substantial project that's I remember. 13. Uh, yeah, 13 megawatts. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so that's that's the one. What about community solar now? What's your view of that? I think it's, so. It's uh, it's just a continuation of the theme, right? More options. This is the idea here is, and the details are uh, still to be worked out. But the, the idea here is, let cust customers who can't have rooftop solar for whatever reason, but want but want something like that give them an opportunity to take a stake in a, in a solar project in a more direct way than just, you know, buying power from, from the utility. Mm -hmm. so, so we think that's a great idea. We'll see what the, the ultimate kind of uh, program that gets approved by the commission yeah. is. But, you know, there's nobody who doesn't think community solar is a good idea that I've, that I've come across. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that, it's a swell bill, I think. And uh, what it means is you get it at all three levels if that's what you want. Yeah. But I, I'm also getting from what you're saying is that next era, um, would be happy to take it at any of those levels, either rooftop, there, uh, community solar, all, that's the law anyway. They all should be part of the mix, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Let's talk about uh, investment in the grid and in storage. You know, a lot of the uh, interconnect issues, um, a lot of the issues we've been talking about could be solved if we had some really good battery systems. Um, and to date, I, I don't know if we're there yet technologically, but what's, what's the plan about investing in smart grid which I think we've invested to some degree, but mm. not not as much as people think. Maybe no. Uh, and uh, and and finding and investing and deploying batteries that really that are really good batteries, yeah. <laughs> big batteries, kind of thing. Uh, what's the plan? So you're right. I mean, technology is going to be a huge part of Hawaii getting to where it wants to get to, which is 100% renewables. Uh, let's start with smart grid. So. Um, Today, Hawaiian Electric does not use a lot of what, what we generally call smart grid technologies, including smart meters. Uh, they have a pilot program, but they haven't done a rollout. They've said That's that the one in uh, Maui. Uh, there is there is a there is a there is a the sort of pilot there. There's also a pilot here on Oahu. Yeah. So they've said you know later this year, uh, probably October or thereabouts, they'll be filing a, a smart grid proposal to the commission. So we'll, we'll see, and we're actually working with them. That, them on that, so I'm not going to pretend I, I don't know what's in it. But you know that is an important step forward for for the state. And in fact, you know D, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, in their in their testimony, cited this and wanting to make sure that that was getting going. Um, you know, at speed. Um, so it's important to the state. Uh, and I think you know, even talking to to rooftop solar people, there's a lot of people in the industry who are really keen to see that moving. So so that's a piece of it. You've been putting money into it, though. Yeah, I mean, it yeah. seems to me that you really can't do this with the new technology uh, and have the necessary effect and, and solve so many of these problems unless you put it. You, you said $60 million before. Was that for grid and the, storage so or something the, else? The $60 million was actually uh, customer savings that we were, oh, sorry. That we were delivering, right? And yeah. so, so it, wasn't, it wasn't investments. Um, we're going to go a little longer than usual, okay, okay. because it's All the right. afternoon. Yeah, so, so anyway, so smart grids, we could talk about why, why it matters and everything, but, you know, there's a general consensus, I think, that it's important to where Hawaii wants to go for, for renewable uh, purposes. And, you know, equally storage. I, I haven't come across anyone who's, you know, interested in energy and technology who doesn't expect that storage is going to be really important here, and there's some impatience about getting more of it on the grids. Um, actually, Hawaii, believe it or not, already is a leader in storage. If you if you look around the country, it's it's very early days in the storage industry. Uh, the costs are coming down quickly. It's one of those things where you, if you're if you're sitting here in Hawaii, you want to manage the intermittent renewables. You know you need storage, but you you the cost it's still expensive and the costs are coming down. So you don't want to jump too far in front of what your needs sure, are. It's like buying right? a new TV, exactly, or a computer or whatever. And so. And so that's the tension, but you know, Hawaiian Electric has, actually has a competitive process underway now to uh, to select some, you know, one or more people to to do a battery storage project here on Oahu. So where would the batteries be, at least in your plan for for upgrading, you know, the grid technology and storage? Would would they be uh, at the utility yeah. end? Would they be at the individual um, homeowner end? Would they be in the middle? Yeah. So this is one of the things that's so cool about the utility business right now is that you've got these new technologies coming in, and then you've got a question like this for which, uh, you know, I'll tell you, I think the answer could very well be all of the above. I mean, there are, uh, in some situations, there's arguments for putting large, more centralized storage facilities. In other, we've seen applications uh, where, you know, where we're working, working on storage projects in Florida where it makes sense to put it at the distribution level, but on the utility side of the meter, so say in a substation, 
Uh, there's some reasons why you might want to do that. And equally, we know homeowners are going to want it in their homes, and we've got to figure out how do we how do we interact with the homeowners. Homeowners can put in their homes and just use it themselves behind the meters, but the logical next step is the homeowner has a storage asset in their home. Maybe they want to have a a contract with the utility where the utility can make use of that storage and compensate them for it. So you might have distributed storage that the utility can actually use. So there's a whole bunch of possibilities and we're still working through all this. LNG. Uh, you, you're doing LNG on the mainland uh, and certainly LNG has had a fair amount of discussion in Hawaii. Uh, and what's interesting is in our Energy Day uh, program two weeks ago there was a substantial percentage but people favored LNG. That actually surprised a lot of people. Really? That surprises yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can, you can get the numbers. Not to say that this is necessarily an accurate survey, uh -huh. but the people who were in attendance, in attendance and listening, there was a substantial number of people who seemed to favor, uh, who voted in favor of LNG. Uh -huh. um, so the, the, uh, where, where are you on that? I mean, are you favoring LNG? Uh, do you see that as part of the, what you're going to do when you, when you come into play? So... So first of all, just to be clear, in Florida, we, we um, import a lot of natural gas. That's, that's, how we, that's a big part of how we got off oil. But we don't have an LNG project in Florida. We bring it in by pipeline. Obviously, the situation's a little different here. Um, so our view on LNG is it's, uh, it, it has potential. Uh, if, if the economics were equal, I would argue it's better for the environment than oil. Um, uh, the economics in a low oil price environment need to prove out. And then you've got all the environmental and cultural concerns that you have with any major energy infrastructure project here in Hawaii. So, so I think we, we definitely believe it's, it's an option board. Hawaiian Electric is doing that. We're helping them. Uh, Hawaii Gas also has an initiative underway to explore it. Um, nobody's brought an application before the commission yet. And until that happens, I think... Um, it, it's really, it's really, a, it's a concept, um, and so it's it's probably too early to say. Uh, but I think you know, at least it warrants the kind of focus and attention that I know it's getting by Hawaiian Electric and Hawaii Gas, and we'll have to see what they come up with. Those are the those are the issues I I understood. You know, people were asking you for a, a plan and a position on, and you know, one of the one of the things that people expect is that the the new the new utility would spend money catching up on technology new you know and, and buy things that maybe we hadn't bought up till now um, invest in, in all of those things uh, can you say what next era would do in the way of that investment i mean have you got a hundred million set aside huh. or a billion what right. does it look so, like for you now so so the first thing is i should probably just step back and say look our our, the, we're, our starting point is what's the right thing for customers right yeah. so we were always i think hawaii has a problem hawaii needs to get to hawaii there's a law and there's an aspiration to get to 100 percent renewables and the rates are really high so we have to find a way to get the rates down and bring in renewable energy. And so we are laser focused on how can we how can we do that for customers, okay? And we don't start with, we have to do this project and we have to do that project. We start with, okay, what are all the things we can do to make things cheaper and cleaner faster? Um, so, so we'll see what happens. We don't, you know, we don't, pe people wonder why, you know, why don't you know exactly what you want to do? It's because actually you have to do a lot of analysis around all these things to, to figure that out. Um, so. That's kind of where we are. Okay. Um, and lastly, um, in the remaining few minutes, I, you know, so David Ige made an opinion, a uh, recommendation, as uh, some people say, um, that, you know, that the that Hawaiian Electric should go this alone without you, um, and that um, your application for approval should be denied. Um, it's a it's very kind of remarkable development in all of this. Uh, I wonder what your reaction to that is. And, on the substance, on the procedure, and how it may affect your view of it going forward. Um, does it change anything? Well, if he had said what you just said, I'd be very concerned. <laughs> I'm sorry, then. <laughs> Tell me what well, he said. Well, I'm still, I'm still concerned, right, whenever the governor holds a press conference and, you know, issues a press release um, that says something about opposing what we're proposing, then, then I'm concerned. Uh, but what he said is he opposed it as it's currently proposed. Right, so he didn't say he's opposed to it no matter what, and uh, and then he, you know, if you go on to look at his concerns, he he spent some time at the at the press conference talking about, you know, not being persuaded 
to this point that we're committed to 100% renewable energy and concerns about local control. And he referred people to their testimony, right? So two of the three state entities have submitted testimony. We talked about the consumer advocate is still coming. So obviously we're going to take all that on board and try to figure out how, how can we, um, you know, how can, we, how can we do a better job of getting the state comfortable on those issues? Yeah, you know, it, uh, it's interesting um, that th this all seems to, and something you said before too, it's, it's all part of a conversation, it seems like. It's all part of a, a negotiation, if you will, um, because whatever is in that document that you, know, you guys have between you and Hawaiian Electric, um, uh, actually, I, I would venture to say it's not carved in stone, it's part of the conversation. And you may change terms of it. You may renegotiate things. And all of this conversation with all these interveners, with the governor, um, with you know the community, if you will, um, it's all part of that extended negotiation. It'd be Isn't great it? if we could have this whole conversation on think tech. Wouldn't that be great? We could just get all the interveners yeah, we work in here. It out, yeah. yeah. But I'm right. I'm on that. Yeah. I mean, that is that is how these things work. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that. Uh, I look, at, at the end, what you've seen is the initial position from interveners. Um, you know, by the end of it, there, I'm not, I'm not going to say how many of each, I don't know, but there may very well be people who say, and there's a couple now that say, you know, we think this is a terrible deal for Hawaii no matter what, right? And there will be others who say, hopefully, you know, we support it based on, you know, the conditions as currently proposed. And there are others who say, you know, we, we might, we don't really pr support it now, but if there were some other conditions that the commission imposed, then we'd support it. So, so those are the options that people have, and I think it's too early to say where people will come out. How do you see it going forward from this point, from where we are now and all of these things we've been talking about? Uh, where do you think it's going to go? Give me a, your, your, your vision of the track ahead, if you don't mind. Well, um, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what I think I know. Uh, oh, for, we, we talked about our testimony, Jeff Ono, the consumer advocate's testimony gets filed later this month, then our testimony at the end of the month. The PUC, uh, Chair has has indicated publicly that uh, he is probably going to hold uh, listening sessions on all of the islands in September and October, and a hearing uh, probably in December. And after that, we'll see. Uh, you know, it'll be up to the commission, and they haven't they haven't said yet whether there'll be you know other ar another opportunity for everybody to make their arguments, and then the commission once the commission has got all all the arguments from everybody, then they're going to take whatever time they they need to take to make their decision. Okay, Eric, there's um, camera two. Whoops, that's camera two. The moment the red light. Could you take a minute and, and tell the people? Whoops, make that camera one. Hmm. Uh, tell the people, um, you know, what you'd like to leave with them today. Maybe thoughts about uh, the essential issue of whether this is in the best interest or not of the people of Hawaii, the public, uh, the ratepayers, what have you. If they're still using that term, <laughs> um, whatever message you'd like yeah. to leave with them. Oh, there it is. Whoops, moving so, target. So. Well, first of all, it, we, we don't use the term ratepayers. Um, we think about customers, and I think in Hawaii, what we've learned is that it, you know, communities are, we, we have to think about this as customers and communities at the same time. And, and we come here because um, you know, we know we bring a lot to the table uh, to help Hawaiian Electric uh, go where Hawaii wants Hawaiian Electric to go, which is 100% renewable energy and cheaper than today. Um, we're obviously going through a process to demonstrate that at the commission, and so I would just ask people to keep an open mind uh, as we work through 40,000 pages and counting of, um, you know, of facts and arguments to substantiate that actually we can really be helpful to, to Hawaiian Electric and Hawaii. And if you were a customer, so to speak, um, what, what, if anything, would you be concerned about? Would you be worried about at this point in Hawaii's energy history? Uh, well, I, you know, this is Hawaii's, Hawaii wants to go where no utility has gone before. Uh, so I'd be concerned, and this is no disrespect to, to the people of Hawaiian Electric, um, but, I, but I'd be concerned about the ability of, uh, you know, a smaller utility to, uh, to, 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 you know, successfully make that transition over the next 30 years. And I'd want to make sure that they had, you know, all the resources that they needed to be successful at that. 
and you could provide additional resources. Well, I think we can certainly help. Yeah. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, there's many more questions, uh, and I hope you'll come back as we go forward on this, and we can talk some more. Good. Thanks, Jay. Aloha.